Okay. All right, welcome back, everyone. This is our second lecture on BC212 Christian Apologetics. Uh, we are uh, continuing in chapter two. We'll finish up chapter two and then move into our next chapter. So let's just go back to where we stop. Hmm. Okay. So we're looking at the philosophical response to this the question about um, God, the existence of God, and so on. So we're asking some simple questions. One is we're saying every effect has to have a cause. That's the first argument. So, to have a universe, you've had to have a cause for this universe. And that cause, we're saying, is the Creator God. Second, for design, there has to be a designer. It's, a, it's an impossibility for design to happen without a designer. And so, if we're saying creation, for creation, you have to have a Creator. And so creation itself requires a creator. Second argument. Third philosophical argument is materiality cannot acquire rationality and morality on its own. So what we are saying is, or what we see in this world is not just matter. We are also seeing rationality. We are seeing people. We are seeing creatures that have some sort of a mind, uh, a thought, the ability to think and make some. And of course, us human beings, we we have a very highly advanced logic and reason, and so on. And then we also seeing morality. That means a sense of right and wrong. I mean, this is right, this is wrong. Do this, don't do this. Be kind, don't hurt. You know, speak the truth, don't lie. That sense of morality. And of course, people can blur it and people can overwrite that sense of morality and corrupt it. But in general, so what we are saying is, how can lifeless matter produce this? In other words, how can just material things acquire this sense of morality, rationality, and so on? So it had to be imparted, had to be given to matter, because matter cannot create this by itself. And the last one is philosophical or a spiritual response is there is supernatural phenomena which again cannot be denied. For instance, when you, uh, one thing, one example we can point to is deliverance. You know, you see people who are demon possessed, even in our world today, and we see demonic manifestation, they begin to manifest. And that cannot be explained through psychology and psychiatry. They may attempt to, but they cannot, especially the cure. So when demons are cast out in the name of Jesus, and a person is completely delivered, and it was through an act of deliverance in the name of Jesus, then psychology and psychiatry cannot explain that. But it's a reality. It's happening before our eyes. So that means demons are real. The authority of the name of Jesus is real, and the individual's experience of possession and thereafter deliverance is real. We can't deny it. It's happening right before our eyes. And that's, we're just referring to that as supernatural phenomena, which cannot be explained by science that studies the mind, whether it's psychology or psychiatry or neurology. Or so on. You can't explain that. It's a supernatural work. And that is pointing to 
the existence of a realm that we can't get a grip on just through scientific research. It's a realm outside of science and scientific research. It's supernatural, but it's surreal. So we are responding. So we're saying, look, think about these things. We are responding from a philosophical and a spiritual side. So theologically, that means biblically, we've said this is what the Bible says about God and creation. You can think about it. Philosophically, just by you know natural reasoning or reasoning about life and so on, these are things you can think about that we've given just four simple thought thoughts that you can think about and say, hey, look, this has to tell me or point me to something outside of this realm, point me to God and the Creator God. Let's go to chapter 3 now. Let me pause here. Uh, everybody is with me. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Everyone's okay? All right. Let's go to chapter 3. So now we are going to spend a lot of our time um, maybe at least another three or maybe four lectures on science, scientific approach, faith in science. Uh, as I said, the kind of questions we face today are quite different from, you know, the early church or the Middle Ages. Today, a lot of questions are scientific in nature. They say, okay, you know, science has discovered this and science has discovered that. And so what do you have to say? You know, is the is what is is what the Bible is saying still relevant? How do we answer those questions? So we are going to spend quite a bit of time looking at it from a scientific thing. Now, now if 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 you find it a little heavy, uh, don't worry. You know, take whatever you can. Uh, and 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 uh, you know I'm not going to ask you scientific questions. I mean, make it difficult for you in the exam. So don't worry about the exam. Uh, take what you can if it's a little outside of your, uh, you know, uh, your field of study because many of us come from different backgrounds. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Just know that that information is available. And if you were asked that question, at least you know where to go, where to find information. And you can, you know, share that with people who might ask you um, those kind of questions. Okay, so it's just going to be a few week, a uh, few more lectures on that scientific. Then we will move on into other things. We'll talk about uh, the Bible. Where did the Bible come from? How do you know the Bible is true and reliable? Then we'll talk about Jesus Christ, uh, about you know his resurrection. And then we go on into other uh, social issues and so on. Okay, so uh, we are going to make that journey. Uh, we are going to be spending a few lectures on science and faith in science. So bear with me if it is a little bit <clears throat> uh, heavy uh, for some of us. It's just going to be a few lectures on that. So let's get started. So now, as a way of introduction to this part, uh, we'll talk about faith in science. Now we're going to be doing a sermon series this this starting in September on faith and science and you know uh, some of these things will be shared um, yeah, and so it's, it's, it will be interesting as well so the when we talk about faith and science it's very interesting that when you go back a few hundred years Many of the great scientists were actually people of faith. So we've given the list of names here, you know, Galileo, Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, Newton, Faraday, Maxwell. Many of these, all of these people were believers in God. And they were pioneers in science. They laid the foundation for modern science very interesting 
but then what happened more so in the last 30 to uh, 30 years or so the you know we refer to them as the new scientists or the new scientific movement these new scientists came up with the idea that faith and science cannot mix so it was a presupposition or it was an assertion that was made by modern scientists or new scientists it actually contradicts scientific foundations or scientific history if you will because if you go back into history you find like I said the pioneers of the scientific field many of them were people of faith who believed in God but it is these new scientific it is this new scientific movement or the new scientists who have presupposed this separation and said if you are a person of science you cannot be a person of faith but that doesn't happen. so the question is you know is that true it's 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 an assertion that's been made but it doesn't have to be true it's a wrong presupposition because for us people of faith science is not a discrediting of God but it is an exploration of the works of God it is an investigation into God's creation and it's not opposed to the Christian faith right? it's not opposed to our faith so we can happily study science and you know whatever field of science you're studying you know whether it's biology astronomy physics chemistry biochemistry genetics or um, whatever field of science you want to go into you can happily go into it as an exploration or an investigation to God's creation not as something outside of God or independent of God but it's something that is helping us know and see and understand how great our God is. So, and you will find uh, if you look at you know the books that have been written in the last thirty years, there's been there is this whole uh, you know argument going on between a group of scientists who are atheists and scientists who are believers and it's you know it's almost like okay one group is saying if you're a scientist you cannot believe in God and then there are other group of scientists and thank God for them who say no you can be a scientist and you can still believe in God it's not a contradiction of faith right so uh, that's very interesting to observe in the last 30 years 30 yeah 30 years or so there's been numerous books and articles you know writing being written from these two sides and uh, and the the argument is uh, or at least you know, what what we want to our position is that you can be a scientist and be a person of great faith in God and science is not a challenge to your faith it's just a exciting journey of faith into exploring God's wonderful creation and like we said earlier Psalm 115 verse 16 we we did this it's you know it says that the heavens belong to the Lord the Lord has made but the earth is given to man he has given this he's put man in charge of the earth and whatever man can do from here it's great it's for us to explore and understand how great our God is. In Isaiah 23 to Isaiah 28, 23, 29, may I request somebody to read that? We we we, we see something very interesting. Isaiah chapter 28, uh, verses 23 to 29. Could somebody read that for us, please? 
Isaiah chapter 28, verse 23 to 29. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin, but the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground, therefore he does not thresh it forever. Break it with his cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. Amen. Mm. Amen. So what is this passage telling us? Basically, this passage is saying, hey, look at the farmer. How does the farmer know that he has to plow the ground a certain way? And then he has to put the seed in the ground a certain way? And then how does he know that? So how does he know that he, to do that? So answer to that is verse 26. God teaches him. That is, God is giving or has given the farmer this understanding of how to engage with the soil and the seed. Then he continues, verse 27, 28. How does a farmer know how to harvest different kinds of grain and how to process it differently? You know, the cumin, he threshes it out. Um, the bread flour, he knows he's got to grind that and make it into flour. And uh, how, did, how does he know to process the grain differently? Then he says, answer is in verse 29, this comes from the Lord. And God is wonderful in counsel and he's excellent in guidance. Now, remember, this was written in Bible times. This was written more than, you know, 2,000 years ago. So in that day, as I say, hey, how does a farmer know what he has to do? How, from where did he get this understanding of sowing seed, plowing the ground, harvesting, processing the grain? And his answer is, God gave this farmer this understanding. The intelligence to engage with creation in this way, and to leverage it, to harness it, and to use it for one's own benefit, that understanding comes from God. So here we are, 2,500 years later. Today, farming has advanced significantly. And even the knowledge to be able to engage with the soil, the seed, and the harvest. We can say that understanding, we are learning, and that learning and the insight, God is giving it to us people. And then it's not just farming, but we are engaging in so many other ways. You know, we've learned how to generate electricity, we've learned how to transmit electricity, we've and there's so much, so much, so much, so much more that we've gained, um, which we are leveraging. And, and, and putting it to our use for our own benefit. Where would that knowledge have come and that ability? And we can say that God's hand is guiding man in his research, in his understanding of his creation. So our exploration of creation, our engagement with creation, our, uh, our understanding and leveraging of whatever is around us for our own benefit, is not against God. It's actually being empowered by God. And God is guiding us. And He's instructing us. And He's encouraging us. And come on, explore. I'll show you how to you know, make use of what I've given to you. So a scientist who's on the front lines of this kind of discovery, 
can actually be a person of faith and actually be empowered by God in doing and exploring all of these things. And like we said also from Romans 1.20, as we look deeper into creation, we are only going to find the invisible attributes of God revealed to us. Right? So for us, science and the exploration of creation, nature around us, does not contradict our Christian faith. It only enhances our Christian faith. The next thing about faith in science is, you know, what about discoveries made in science and that cannot be explained by biblical accounts? So, how do we respond to that? Right? So, the Bible as a book, the Bible, or we can put it like this. Um, first of all, the Bible is not an encyclopedia of everything. Right? So the Bible is not an encyclopedia of all the birds that God created. It's not an encyclopedia of all the animals God created. It's not an encyclopedia of all kinds of people uh, that God created. No. It's, it's what God has revealed to us for what we need to know in His plan for mankind. But it's not an encyclopedia of you know, all the stars and all the planets and all of this universe and all of creation. So obviously, we are going to discover a lot of things in creation which is not written about in the Bible. We're going to see a lot of creatures that are not mentioned at all in the Bible. Are we going to read about a lot of birds and animals and other things? Are we going to read about the? Are we going to uh, discover things in space about stars and planets and other things that are happening uh, that are not written about in the Bible? And that's perfectly fine because the Bible does not claim to be an encyclopedia of everything. It has information for us. On things that God wants us to know. And the Bible itself makes this statement, Deuteronomy 29, 29 is an easy uh, reference to remember. In Deuteronomy 29, and verse 29, I'll just read that. Uh, he says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things that have not been revealed to us, but what has been revealed to us is for us to live by. So the Bible is saying, look, there are many secret things, hidden things, unknown things, that are not you know, revealed here. So we are not unsettled by the fact that the body of knowledge that's available, which is constantly growing, is far beyond the information contained in the Bible. That's okay. Because the Bible is not a, you know, a repository of all knowledge. It's not. The Bible is God's book for us to show us how to walk with Him. So, it's perfectly fine when people in science or through science discover so many things. It's okay. It doesn't unsettle us. It doesn't negate the fact that we believe God's word. And so, you know, in, in, a, in a future lesson, we'll talk about you know, the Bible itself. But this is something we need to keep in mind. Another related question is, should we use science to interpret the Bible? That means, you know, uh, can I superimpose science on the Bible and then change what the Bible says to accommodate or to explain the things that science claims about, uh, you know, 
what what life about the material universe should we do that so here's the thing we do apply knowledge or our science or scientific knowledge we do apply that in order to understand the text of the scriptures but we do not we don't have the right to change what the scriptures are saying in order to accommodate what science would claim now let me explain so in trying to understand the scripture of course we use knowledge we use the normal language of speech or language rules of language to understand the Bible so when we look into the Bible uh, we you know we read it we understand it using knowledge using our understanding of language and this is how language is written this is what it means and in language there are figures of speech uh, and there are metaphors there are things that are not literal uh, there are things that are figurative there are things that are representative and so on so when we read the bible and the bible for example uses uh, you know phrases like the foundations of the earth well that's a phrase it's a metaphor it's not literal it doesn't mean that the earth is standing on some foundation no we know the earth is round and it's it's suspended in space and it's spinning around it's going around, it's rotating on its axis, spinning around the sun. And so we know that we are, we, the Earth is not st st stationary on some foundation. So when we, you know, there's this example that of, of, of lit literary language. And so it has to be understood in that sense. Uh, the Bible uses a lot of figures of speech, you know. The nations are like a drop in a bucket. That's a figure of speech. Um, he God measures the heavens with a span. They're just telling us that God is so big he can do that. Doesn't mean he's putting out his hand and measuring the heavens with a span. They're just telling us it's just a language, a literary language uh, that is telling us, you know, about God. So, like this, there are many um, examples. So the Bible has to be understood from that perspective as a literary book. It's understood. Um, using the knowledge we have so yes in that sense we apply our knowledge our scientific knowledge in understanding the text but we have to be careful second point we have to be careful in trying to change what the Bible is saying to accommodate what science may be claiming so science is going to be scientific knowledge the body of scientific knowledge is constantly evolving they are coming up with new discoveries new theories new ideas um, uh, you know and so on that's evolving constantly so for example in times past scientists believed that uh, the universe was in a steady state that means the universe was brought into exist you know just just came into being the way it was from the beginning but then they later changed saying the universe actually had a beginning so it didn't begin in an expanded steady state it began with it started as with the beginning and then it's constantly expanding so that's the current idea of science. That means the universe had a beginning and then it's expanding. So the point is scientific understanding is evolving, it's changing. Uh, ideas that, that were once held as true are later modified or sometimes even fully discarded and replaced with new ideas and new understanding uh, as our, our knowledge increases. So, if we are going to interpret the Bible to align itself to scientific knowledge, then our interpretation of the Bible will keep on changing. And that, that is unacceptable. So, what are we saying? We are saying that we cannot 
superimpose scientific knowledge on the Bible and then change the explanations to match that. We cannot do that. The Bible is final authority and we stay with what the Bible says. So one of the things that we will talk about is creation. The Bible says God created everything, so we don't change that. The Bible says there were six days of creation we, uh, in, in, in what God did, as described in Genesis chapter 1. We don't change that. There are things that we don't know before and after, uh, before that. Okay, so we leave that as a blank space. We don't know. We will get into that later. But what we do know, we do not change. That means what the Bible has described for us in Genesis 1, we stay with that. We don't change what Genesis 1 says in order to accommodate some idea proposed by scientific community at this time, because we know that could change over time. Okay? And lastly, our goal is not to fight, but to present truth in love. Right? That means we are not here to fight against the scientific community. There is not a fight between the theological community and the scientific community. It's not a battle against each other. No, we are here to present truth and love, and we're here to walk together. That means our science doesn't threaten our faith. Uh, uh, doesn't threaten the, our theological understanding, but we are growing in both. We're growing in our theological understanding, we're growing in uh, science, but there are some non-negotiables as far as theology is concerned because the Bible doesn't change. The Bible is final. It's final authority. And we present this truth in love. Well, the body of scientific knowledge is changing, it's evolving, and it's, it's growing. The Bible stays with the truth that it presents to us, and that truth does not change. So we present truth in love. We're not here to fight with each other. Could somebody read for us First Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21? After this, I'll pause to take any questions. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. Somebody read that for us, please. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith. Please be with you. Hmm. So, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, guard or protect this truth, you know, the truth that we have been given. Protect the truth, guard it. Don't get into these, you know, useless, uh, empty discussions and into these arguments about what people pretend or call as knowledge. Don't get into all of that. Just don't get into these fighting with them. It's not that we are afraid of these arguments, but our, we, we, we have the truth. And we don't want to just get into those kinds of arguments with them. Because people have engaged in that, they've just departed from the faith. Right? So our goal is, there is theological truth, the biblical truth. We are welcome and open to scientific knowledge. But we are, here not, we are not here to fight and argue. We're here to present truth and love, and we're here to walk as, as a person of faith. I look at science as, as something that strengthens my faith, not as something that I fight against, and not as something opposing my faith. You know, our approach is like I, we mentioned in the earlier section. Science helps us to see the grandeur of God, right? So our goal is not to fight, but we present truth and love. Uh, but we don't let science contradict or override the truth that the Bible presents to us. God's truth is non-negotiable. So we stand firm on that and we guard that. Okay, let me pause you and see if there are any questions so far. Is everybody with me? Uh, uh, everything is okay so far?
All okay? Yes, Pastor. Okay, great. Any questions so far? Okay. All right. Okay, good, good. All okay. Well, yeah, I see all your responses in chat. Thank you. All right, so if you feel uh, you're missing me somewhere, just let me know. Just want you to understand it, think about it. And if you need to go back and listen to the uh, lecture again a second time, uh, <clears throat> I'd encourage you to do that in case uh, you miss something. All right, let's take up a few more points before we uh, wrap up for today. Um, now, next question. So we're just looking at faith and science, right? Can science explain everything? You know, now scientists generally, especially the group of scientists who are uh, strong atheists, they say, hey, look, um, we have answers. We can answer things. You know, science is giving us answers to all kinds of things. But actually, if you pause and think about it, there are genuine questions that all of us have as people. And science doesn't give us satisfactory answers to these, what we would refer to as the big questions of life. I mean, some people say, hey, these questions don't matter, but they do matter. What are some of these big questions? Where did we come from? So, questions about our origin. And the Christian faith says, you know, hey, God created us for a purpose. Whereas an athe the atheistic naturalism point of view as well, we just came over primitive forms of life. So that means we're saying it, this is just a happening of matter that just evolved. Things happened and we just came. So we are here. And there is no greater, bigger purpose other than the purpose you would want to find for yourself. Another question, who are we? The Bible tells us we are people who have been made in God's image. So we are bearers of something that's greater and grander. We are bearers of the image of the Creator. An atheist would we have to conclude from that body of knowledge that we're just mud that's been organized like this. We're just a higher life form, better than, you know, a chimpanzee or something. That's all. Meaning, why am I here? You know, the Bible tells us you're here to glorify God, you're here to serve His purposes, there's meaning to your existence that's found in God. But if you look at it from an atheistic, it's like, hey, whatever you define life to be, find your own purpose. And if you can't find it, it's going to be a purposeless existence. You're just going to live and die, and that's the end of it. The moment you stop breathing, everything is over. Morality. What is right and wrong? How should we live? Well, there are clearly defined biblical standards. The Bible is unambiguous about what's right and wrong. Whereas, if you look at it from an atheistic point of view, that there's no God, well, you define what you want. Whatever you feel is right, that's right. That's such a dangerous thing because Everybody can then say, hey, I feel this is right, I'll do it. Or I have a reason. And that's why there's so much of fighting and confusion in the world today. Because we are trying to accommodate this. We're trying to accommodate everybody's definition of morality. And that's going to be an endless struggle. Because everybody wants to be accepted for what they say is right and wrong. And that's going to be endless. Then last question. Where are we headed? Where are we going? Uh, is, is there all 
is this all there is to life? I live and then I die. The Bible is saying there's more to life. There's eternity. And an atheistic view says there's nothing. Sorry, the spelling mistake here. There's nothing beyond this life. It's all over. So, in some of the most important questions of life, I sometimes some say, well, well, these questions don't amount to anything. You know, I'm just concerned with, you know, today. And of course, we have all. We are all concerned with matters of of day to day matters, but these are important questions because they define how we are going to spend whatever time we have here on earth and the bible gives us answers whereas an atheistic worldview just leaves everything unresolved there is no satisfactory answer to these questions of life so if you think about this a little bit more science through science through our experimentation through our you know our, our, our work and effort we understand what is there but it doesn't tell us why and how you know the bigger questions so for example science tells us there is gravity we can tell you know it is there we can tell how to use it we can tell you know how to calculate it and we can tell how we can leverage that but we can't explain why and how did this come into existence that means if we go back in time in the beginning and you say everything happened by accident it happened without the presence of a designer then how did something that had that had no knowledge of the importance of gravity how did that initial point in time decide or determine the existence of the need for gravity and put it in place and make it so precise Science tells us gravity is there, but it doesn't tell us why and how it came into existence. So it's on answering those questions. So, like this, many things in nature, science will help us uh, uh, help us discover science that does nature. Uh, it cannot tell us how it came into existence. They tell us that this law is so important, it is there. We can write, we can capture it in an equation or in some sort of a process that is very clearly defined. If it's, you know, if it's some sort of a biochemical process. So like this is what is happening, this is how the chemicals interact, and this is what happens, and this is how it comes out. Uh, all of that, we can describe what we observe, but we can't say, you know, how did this actually come to, into place? And why? Who brought it in there? You can't answer that. We can tell you what is there. So, what are we saying? Science does, in, in response to this question, can science explain everything? And what we are saying is this, that there are the big questions of life, which all of us, if we are willing to pause and think, we would like to have answers to these questions. 
the Bible is providing answers and science or a, a, an atheistic perspective is giving us ambiguous statements so in a sense they don't they don't have a clear answer and secondly when we look at what we can learn through science science discovers what is there which is very wonderful very fascinating but it doesn't tell us why and how or who put that there it tells us it's there this is what is happening this is what's going on this is what is the outcome but why how and who we don't know so that those questions remain unanswered even though the discoveries are wonderful, amazing, and we make use of it. So can science explain everything? From these two broad sets of questions, they don't. Science doesn't. They remain unanswered from you know, in these two broad things. Okay? So we will pause here. Uh, I know we have three more minutes, but we'll pause here. We will pick up on other, some other questions on faith and science. And then next week, we will get into talking about um, Darwin's theory. We'll talk about a little bit of uh, evolutionary, oh, sorry, first we will talk about uh, our scientific uh, response to the question on creation, existence of God. We will do that. Then we'll spend some time a little bit on Darwin's theory and evolutionary biology, and then we we'll spend some time on uh, the Big Bang cosmology. Right? So we look at those things. So it'll be a little, uh, you know, more from a science perspective, but I'll just try to make it as simple as possible for us so that you know that there are these answers that we can give, and then we will uh, move forward into other topics. Okay? So we'll start from here next Sunday, as science, uh, next week, as science done away with God. Okay? Um, let's see. All right. Any questions before we close and dismiss? Okay. May I request somebody to just pray with a class and then we will uh, dismiss? Please. Uh, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this time of learning. Lord, we pray that we will be able to uh, remember and also um, to have a good grip, good understanding of what we are learning and we'll be ready to uh, give an answer, a defense to all the questions that could come, that could arise. We pray, O oh God, that we would be also able to minister to people uh, from the uh, intensity of the knowledge. We pray, O oh God, that uh, it would be a blessing for everyone uh, in the class and also to the people whom we minister to, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for Pastor. We thank you for sharing uh, uh, your word through him, O oh God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, have a quick break and enjoy your next class. God bless. Bye now.